seen our kids since March and we miss them. We miss our teachers. Uh, COVID response naturally has driven us apart. Uh, the distancing, the masks, strong opinions on a lot of topics, virtual versus in-person versus homeschool. And, and it's just naturally been something that's pushed back, pushed, pushed away. And the challenge, I wanna challenge you, challenge us as a school district, as a community as a whole, if, is what if our community and school district were different than that? What if we were brought together, even if distanced um, in this? What if we lived up to our motto and our heritage as a community that together we are mighty, um, that we respond with grace, space, and understanding to pull off what's in front of us? Um, what we're about to do together as a, as, a, as a family, as a group, is something that no one has done before, a virtual model of schooling and offering in person with protocols that have never been done before. Virtual, in person, tested for COVID, chosen to homeschool, mask advocate or non-mask, so many things to separate. Let's not allow that to be what defines this year or, or this fall for us. Um, what remains is our beliefs um, since 1895, faith, family, and education, that we are mighty together as we pull, pull together. It's gonna be messy and not perfect. Um, we don't have all the answers. Today we're gonna to talk about our guidance. Um, campus, uh, campuses are still working on, on some of those specifics and will as we wait for those, you know, our four to five weeks before school, kids get back in school. Um, there's lots of things that we've never done before. We've never had to consider age appropriateness for masks. We're gonna learn and adapt and rely on our greatest resource our teachers and our administrators that care for your kids. Um, so in that time frame, we're gonna have a lot more information and then campuses are gonna have a lot of specific information for you about locations for arrival, locations for dismissal, specifics. So today our focus is gonna be the safety protocols. Um, hope you've seen or have maybe even in front of you the district document. It's on our website on a reopening page. Um, and there's a lot of questions that can be answered there for you. Uh, today, we're gonna focus on those safety protocols. Teaching and learning, we've seen a lot of questions about the teaching and learning side, virtual instruction, some of the in-person instruction side. At the end of this week, you'll receive a video, it'll sky alert out to you from our teaching and learning team that are working on that, that I think is gonna help answer a lot of questions. Um, we'll do our second Facebook Live Town Hall next Tuesday the 28th at 11 a.m. Um, and we're gonna focus there on the virtual and in-person uh, uh, instruction questions. Enrollment's open right now for uh, um, the virtual option. Uh, I just looked before I came, into, came out of my office right now, we have 450 virtual uh, students that have been have enrolled. So that'll give you kind of an idea of where we were. Our previous, just to get an idea of what that might look like, was just short of a thousand kids, 950, 960-ish. Um, so uh, that gives you an idea of what it was, and, and now we're sitting about at about 450. So we don't have our teachers back to work through all these things until August 12th, so we're continuing to work to prepare for that. Um, when they come back on contract again, uh, again, that, that time is gonna be very essential. Um, so we have a list of questions to start out from that we've captured from social media or they've been emailed to our communications department or to other people within the office that we're gonna start out there to answer. But put your questions in the feed and we'll answer them uh, as we go or, or capture for later frequently asked questions. So at the end of our time, uh, at about 4.15, uh, is when we'll end, I'm gonna to speak to the email I sent you uh, yesterday, hope you've seen that, about the consideration for a schedule change for the start of school with our board. Um, I'm gonna hit that at the end so we can, we can focus on protocols. So to start out with, I just wanna walk through what would a typical day be of a, of a student. So um, based, on, based on the protocols to start driving out questions from there. So the first thing, um, you know, looking forward to school, wake up uh, in person, speaking specifically to, will be for you as a parent to fill out, a, take a temperature and fill out a screening. 
as something that we've done every day. This is, when, when, when I walk in uh, to my office, this is the, the page that's on the back with the QR code. That will be something that you'll get that will go to a Google document with basically two questions on it that'll talk about the screening uh, symptoms and then have you been around a lab tested positive COVID-19 uh, person. So basically those are gonna be something that you're gonna answer yes or no to. Uh, that'll go into a, a electronic uh, database that will, if you've forgotten to do that, will generate an email back out to you that you didn't fill out your screening for that day. If I were a bus rider, I would go to the bus stop. We would ask that kids would have but their masks on at the bus stop, distance away. You're, you've been training, working with them on that so far, and another thing to work on through the summer as a parent training your, your, own, your own kids. Uh, as they get on the bus, to have a mask on, would have a um, hand sanitizer station, hit that hand sanitizer station, and sit two to a seat with an assigned seat, uh, a person who's assigned. Uh, that's going to be important when we start talking about, Mr. Kreider starts talking about close and personal contact uh, with students. Ride the bus to school and then arrival. Um, arrival at campuses, elementary and secondary uh, will depend on the times, but elementary would arrive to designated areas where distancing can be maximized. Secondary the same way, they've established areas where distancing can be maximized. Then at the elementary levels, as they, uh, um, as they come up to the time when we have people in place, they'll be going to the classrooms. Everyone's working on their protocols, but even in, in, in talking to our, um, our secondary principals today, um, as they uh, go to those areas, it would be an area of distancing. Obviously, it's something that we'd want to have, have masks on. Um, then in class, you know, moving to class. So at the, at the secondary level, uh, classes will have very similar sizes to what they've, they've had, minus the virtual students that have been pulled out of those classes. Um, elementaries will be smaller based on how many uh, virtual students they had. They could be smaller, they could be very similar to the 22 students. If they're not able to distance, that would be where they would need to wear masks. And I'll talk about the pre-K through uh, second graders here in just a minute. We'll, we'll focus on masks in, in, a, in a section. Um, so uh, at the elementary, teachers will come to the students. Our focus at elementary is to keep class groups together to be able to identify that close and personal contact um, to, to keep from uh, quarantining a lot of kids or having to, if we did have a case, um, uh, send a lot of a lot of students home or, or teachers home. So if if um, Eric and I were partner teachers for uh, Stacy, who's sitting over here across from us, Stacy would be in her classroom, and I, as the English teacher, would teach her there, and then Eric would come in as the math teacher to teach her there. We would do the same with the electives, except for PE. It's important for our kids to get out and move around. We'll be going, they'll be going to the gym, keeping in class groups out when the weather's good, be able to take them outside uh, to play and to, to move around. Um, at the secondary level, students will move to their classes. Um, uh, we'll be shortening the times to make that, that move quicker. Hallways will be uh, one way on one side and one way on the other side. Uh, like a freeway would be. We'd have folks in those hallways to make sure we're, we're keeping our masks on. Um, that would be the transition. Lunch, um, again, the elementary, the goal is to keep groups together and be able to um, keep spaces between. So schedule lunches to keep class groups uh, differentiated uh, apart from each other. At the secondary will be, uh, at the high school specifically, there's areas to serve in the malls. There'll be tables in the malls and be tables also in the cafeteria with limited seating around them. Uh, would ask students to you know, wear masks. Uh, and then obviously when you eat, that's not something that you can do, um, but would be able to keep in those, in those areas. Recess for our elementary students, it's important again for them to be outside. We would just work on keeping those class groups together uh, outside for recess versus mixing large groups together, but that class group would be able to play together. And then dismissal would be staggered. Uh, um, staggered with you know, another important time for masks or face shields, face coverings to be, to be put on. 
um, to stagger out. Dismissal is one of our biggest challenges. It's a time when masks are going to be important. Uh, arrival at the high school too have been one of the, the pieces discussing would be a staggered arrival time for certain grade levels so that not everyone's arriving at the exact same time uh, at, at our largest campus. So that just walks you through uh, a little bit of the um, uh, what a day in the life might look like. Uh, one of the most important, I think, terms that we'll come to know together is this term of close and personal contact. And as you look through our guidance, you see that really drives out the quarantine requirements, um, the, the you know, shutdown possibilities. And so I'm gonna ask uh, Eric Kreider to go through, before we talk about masks, to go through close and personal contact and what's important about that in terms of um, quarantining and also shutting down the classroom. Eric? So what's significant about the close contact, and we have it defined here, being directly exposed to infectious secretions uh, being coughed on while not wearing a mask or a face shield or being within six feet for a cumulative duration of 15 minutes while not, while not wearing a mask or a face shield. So that's very important when we go back to uh, do contact tracing if we have a lab confirmed case within the school and we're trying to identify those individuals who had close and personal contact. Um, we have a closure document, a closure uh, standard response protocol that we're going to be using. Um, and it's broken down into four levels, level one through four. There's a blue level one, which is we have no cases of COVID-19 among staff or students, and we're maintaining the uh, safety protocols and health, healthy environments are in place. When we go to a level two green, we're talking about minimal confirmed cases in the classroom or across the campus. Persons who had close and personal contact would be advised to self-quarantine for 14 days. And I go back to that definition of close contact and how that's defined um, for those that would have to self-quarantine. And that area of the campus would be closed off for deep cleaning and disinfecting, and we would send out communications to all parents and staff members of the affected school. If we go on to a level three orange, we break it down into two categories. We have a classroom category and we have a campus category. Um, on a, in a classroom setting, a moderate number of confirmed cases in a classroom over 10%. Um, evidence of community spread within that classroom and it's students and staff must move to a virtual learning for one to a maximum of five days. Now I don't want people to get confused with this. This is going to depend upon the time it takes us to clean that room and get it back ready for those students to be back in there, especially those that weren't uh, the ones that we identified to have that close and personal contact, we bring them back as soon as we can, as soon as we get that room cleaned and disinfected. Uh, the TEA, Texas Education Agency, is the one allowing us of a maximum up to five days. So we could be closed for a maximum of five days allowable per the Texas Education Agency. However, our goal and objective would be to get those students back in the classroom as quickly as possible. So the deep cleaning of that area would uh, commence as soon as we determine the need for it. And once again, we send out a communications. For the level three orange campus, you've got a moderate number of confirmed cases on a com campus or facility, 5%. Um, evidence of community spread within the, within the facility. Um, students and staff would move to virtual for the amount of time it takes us to clean and disinfect the campus and do the contact tracing to notify those that had that close and personal contact as we defined it. So we're not saying we're gonna shut the campus down for five days and everybody's going virtual. We're allowing up to five days, a minimum of one day, um, in order to clean and disinfect the campus and get everybody back in. We would cancel all activities and send out communications via SkyAlert. The last category is red, um, level four, this is uh, substantial transmission of COVID across uh, multiple campuses and community spread across FISD as confirmed by Galveston County Health Department. Um, this means that all facilities close for a maximum period again of five days or the maximum, that's the maximum time allowed. However, 
the sooner we get in there, get in those facilities and disinfect and clean that we can get those students back in the campus. Um, students and staff at that time would move to virtual operations. Uh, deep cleaning and disinfecting of those facilities would take place. All activities canceled and communication sent out once again via Skyward. And I want to explain too in the close and personal contact, when we're notifying these individuals, we're notifying individuals that close and personal contact that we know of within the school maybe in that classroom setting or wherever that student has been in school, who they've had close and personal contact with. The tracing piece is a Galveston County Health District piece that they will go back and do tracing. So you could expect uh, contact from them, one of their contact tracing persons to um, figure out the tracing for that student. However, we will notify persons of close contact that we know of within the school. Um, and all these decisions and things that we uh, have to go through here are guidelines and they're subject to change based upon the situation as it changes. It's a moving target for us. It's a moving target for everybody. So Eric, walk me through this. So if I'm a fourth grader in, in Miss Patton's or uh, in Miss Patton's class at Ed Vale, and we have two students that are lab tested positive within that room, okay? Um, and it's under, under the 10%. Who goes home? Who has to go quarantine in that classroom? So those two kids automatically, because of COVID right. positive, would be ones that would be out of that classroom setting. Right. Other than that, it's the ones that have that personal and close contact. So, so if I have my mask on, and I've had a, had a mask on, and I haven't been within the six feet for 15 minutes or more and had that, then would that be close and personal contact? That would not be, and you wouldn't be asked to quarantine at that time. You would be able to come back to school once we clean and disinfected that classroom and got it back together. But if it was three students, that would be over 10%. Correct. So at that point, that classroom would shut down to be able to clean for five days. So those students would jump to virtual for five days or less. If you could get it clean that night with your team or the next day, then we would make communication with that class to be able to come back. Yes, sir. And then the, all of Bales would receive a letter from our communication department that said, we've had a lab tested positive case of COVID-19. COVID we wouldn't be able to share the name because of FERPA or HIPAA, but would be able to do that. There was a question I know about the screening, and then I'll, we'll see what other questions are, are popping up. Who's looking at the screening? The screening's intent is to help us work together as a team to be aware of symptoms and be aware of uh, those things that are out of normal. That's one of the key words in the symptoms page that are uh, symptoms that are not normal. So there's a list of those symptoms in our document and uh, you know your kids, those things that are outside of normal for us, us as well as employees, um, and we have to check those, then uh, uh, obviously you wouldn't be able to pass your screener. We will have someone checking for anyone who might have put, yes, I have those symptoms each day. Uh, but really the intent of the screener would be to uh, um, kick out and let people know they need to continue that screening to be aware and, and know that um, that's important. So if a screener wasn't filled out, uh, the student would still come to school that day. They would, be, they would be able to go to school. We would just kick out those reminders as we're growing into this process of knowing that's an important part of Friendswood ISD this year for staff, for all of us, for anyone coming in. Uh, if you look at the most recent UIL guidance, that's another piece of it for even fans um, that, are, that are coming in. So those screenings are important for us uh, to help create that culture. Are there any question, other questions, guys, that we ought to hit right now before we move on? There's uh, quite a few questions about the staggeredness of the arrival and dismissal. Will it be impacted? Will transportation on buses still be provided? How will it be impacted by the staggered? Kind of, I think, perhaps describe the length of time. The staggered isn't necessarily a large right, amount right. of time. So um, the, the staggered arrival is really, uh, when you talk about the high school where we have 2,000 students, uh, their considerations right now are to give time blocks to be able to certain grade levels to arrive um, during those times so we don't have everybody arriving. Bus schedules across the district are all gonna run 
on a typical time. We're going to have to have some double runs of areas that are um, high density and uh, that was part of, we, we, we had to make a, a tough choice to not serve uh, kids at daycares to be able to take those 10 routes and move them into places where we've had high density. So um, the, the, the staggering, really I'm talking about where the secondary schools where they, um, uh, where they have a large number of students. And Mr. Rohr, if um, there's times like that where it's grade levels, if families have children in both grade levels, how will that be handled? We're, those are some really specific details. And so right now, that, that's, if, if you look at our guidance, it is just to keep those groups smaller. So that's one of those things as we work through this towards the beginning of school, you're going to get some specific directions out for campuses about each one of those pieces. It's hard to answer today, um, but what we know we can, we can share with you today. So let's go back to mass. Can you talk to us about mass? Sure. So, uh, you know, I'm pulling up our uh, guidance for face coverings. You know, as the guidance came out on July 7th uh, from the state, it incorporated the governor's orders from 10, uh, 10 and over, um, which takes you fourth grade and up. And it also allows for um, uh, requiring masks for those who are younger. And I know that's the bigger that's the biggest concern. You know, I, I can't send my kid to school, a uh, young, young student, and have to wear a mask all day. And wearing masks, you know, tough anyway. What, first of all, what a mask is. So this, this is my collection. So uh, um, what we could do. So this is, this is the, Mustang, the Mustang buff. I got this on uh, that covers up my, my face and my, uh, my nose and my mouth. You can probably fold this down and do that better. That's something you can do. And then I got my collection. Got my friends with ISDs, it'll be issued to all staff. I got the We Are Mighty uh, buff, which I'm sure those will be on sale soon, possibly. Uh, and I have my, this is my historic keepsake, the Friends with Class of 2020 mask. Uh, Mr. Kreider, you got a face shield over there. Mr. Kreider's a, a Marine, so he's got his Marine mask on. And this is his, uh, the, the face shields that we'll purchase one of those for every uh, staff member and a mask for every staff member too. So in terms of what you can wear, that would, that would be what? Staff and students, um, grades three and above, will uh, have masks on. Um, the important part of time is whenever distancing is not possible. So whenever that six foot of distance cannot be kept is when we would ask for masks to be on. And that's for the protection of our staff to keep schools moving and really, as we listen to our doctors, um, and you've read, you know, studies from a lot of different, Texas A&M put out a big study about the importance of masks. You've seen a lot of information coming out recently, and it's the governor's, you know, the governor's orders based on that, is that's one of our keys for the close and personal contact. So keeping your kids in school and us keeping, keeping going is that uh, wearing that mask. So the younger students, um, biggest concern. So age appropriate, just our, our documentation says age appropriateness for younger students pre-K through two while in classrooms will become the feasibility for these younger students. This is something we're gonna have to learn about. Um, all of the guidance that's written for um, uh, age appropriateness isn't done by a kindergarten teacher. Our teachers, our staff are going to be the ones as we bring them back and figure out what age appropriateness is, when would those masks be on, is there a mask time that's on. Um, in the classroom, knowing that's difficult for those young guys, those little guys to wear a mask all day long. Um, but we're going to have to learn through this as a, as a community, as, a, as an elementary uh, group. Um, really, our only school that has that pre-K through two is Westwood. All of the other schools have grades three and, and, and above, um, which is, is significant, makes that important. Um, so, you know, what you're sitting there at home saying, give us a hard, fast rule for mask for pre-K through two, we don't have one today. Um, other than we want those on when, when they're coming to uh, arrival, dismissal, when they're going to be together with with groups of kids um, when they're transitioning and going to be around other other students um, to, that aren't within those classes. So.
So those are things that we're going to work through together as a team. I, I guess it's important to know when you're deciding on sending your student to school or choosing virtual is that we will have masks as part of our routines at pre-K through two. Um, and then the other, other uh, grades will be, you know, whenever distancing is possible, that would be, a, you know, a mask break time. It's important for our teachers to feel safe uh, where they are. They're, they're a key component of all of this. So there may be times when those, all those masks, there, there will be times, and, and most of the time we're not able to distance in classrooms, so that masks will have to be worn in classrooms. Um, bus riders, again, that's very important. UIL guidance just came out. This document was written prior to the UIL guidance that just came out yesterday, but it also does require masks um, for, for our UIL participants um, at specific times when not actually physically uh, in the midst of competition. But don't want to really get into UIL requirements today. We still are, are breaking it down together as a team uh, with our athletic directors and, and uh, haven't really got a chance to, to put that through, but that'll be, that'll be what's coming next. Um, anyone coming up would need to, to have a mask on. I mean, now's the time to start figuring out what masks work best uh, and, and, and comfortable. And they can be kids' favorites. You know, I, I had a parent the other day send me some things with some LSU masks on it, and I, I want to make sure none of you A&M or UT fans are going to let, let them get away with that without uh, uh, masks on for, for who, they, who your kids support. So whatever you know, uh, fits them best um, is, is where we're, what we're looking for. So any, any other questions about masks? I'm sure there's a lot of questions. No. Okay. I mean, there are questions, but I think you answered everything that there was to answer about masks. Mask. Um, let's move uh, next to, um, some parents would lie on the screening uh, is one of our questions. Wouldn't it be better and if an objective person did temperature checks at school. We have been doing temperature checks for students all through the summer and through our MAT camp um, and our activities right now. TEA guidance does actually says we do not recommend uh, temperatures. Um, as we worked with our reopening committee, with our doctors, with our nurses and those, um, what we found out and was shared with, with us by TEA as well is as, as we've started to take temperatures of students, or I guess across the, the state, what they found was a, a, a number of false positives, um, the challenge of that, the um, asymptomatic students um, that don't have a temperature uh, that, um, you know, is, which is the reason why in a lot of ways you're, you're taking that temperature. And then when you think about the logistics of taking the temperature of every student, uh, versus keeping them distant, distanced uh, as best we can, staggered start. Uh, the risk versus the reward of taking a temperature was not, the, um, was not something that we wanted to move forward with. So our reopening committee, uh, talking about those temperatures and, and piling up at doors, because remember we're still looking, safety is still an important part of what we're doing, Think, are things that we've done with that, um, the temperatures didn't, didn't, didn't make, make sense. Um, I think there's several questions about will these be reevaluated? So will masks, uh, all the different pieces be reevaluated? Well, I, I really hope so. I, I really hope that we're finding, um, we're having, you know, either some, some responses to COVID that makes it different, or we have a vaccination for COVID that's going to make it different. If what we have is working and keeping the spread from, from happening in Friendswood ISD, we're gonna keep doing what we're doing. Um, but again, we'll, we'll talk to the, the experts and get good guidance from our health department, our doctors in the area. We have great relationships with, with doctors in our area and uh, we'll make considerations for that. Those that um, uh, we get from TEA, again, we'll, we'll look at those closely and, and make changes to that document as, as needed. Um, uh, we have a question about the junior high and carrying a backpack. Um, since we're not having lockers in the hallways at junior high, we will have students uh, bring their backpack to have their, their own supplies, not have shared supplies, or not be at those lockers where 
if you've ever looked down the hallway at the junior high with lockers, there's a lot of, a lot of students in those one areas. So we want them to be able to move and limit that time, so limit that close and personal contact down. Um, so they will bring backpacks. I talked to Mr. Drew this morning. Again, they're shaping all of this as a, as a team. And again, we need our teachers to come back and be part of that. But what he talked to me about this morning was you know, the idea of not having large um, binders and those things as part of that, if we could figure a way to, to do that a little bit differently to make those um, not as cumbersome. That's one of the things that they're working on. Can you, can you speak to, um, we have some uh, kindergarten parents that want to know what that's going to look like, what school is going to look like for their kindergartner, what, what it's going to be like on the first day. Are they going to be able to walk in with their kindergartners into school on the first day? We're working through right now, one of the hardest questions is, is, is that. And I don't, to be honest with you, I, we, we, we won't let large numbers of, of parents outside walk students in, but how do we do that? Um, what might that look like at the entry area? It's one of our, as we look at our school schedule, um, how we're gonna enter school uh, on the 19th um, as we, the board considers that, and I'll talk about that there at the end, is, is a big part of that, of the answer to that question, um, is how we're, we're able to do that, which is just, it's very difficult um, all of these things that we've never done before because we as a community, I mean, our call to action and these beliefs that are behind me all center around, it's what I started out talking about, uh, being close, building relationships, and to have something like COVID that forces distancing like that just doesn't feel good. And uh, those are the things that we're going to need to work through and overcome for what the first day of school might look like for kindergarten, for kindergarten students. Um, Stacy, do you have any questions that you see? Not right now. An important thing that I would like to point out to parents and the community members is that our uh, custodial and campus cleaning is gonna look a little different than it would normally look uh, in the past. Um, we are gonna align our custodians to have more custodians available during the day, during the day for frequently touched surfaces um, and aligning our staff correctly to make sure that we're disinfecting and doing the things that we need to do as far as keeping the campus clean so that at night we can focus our efforts on a pure section of those classrooms and areas of the campus that haven't already been disinfected and cleaned during the day. Um, that's it on that, sir. Just, okay. I just wanted to touch that. Okay. I thought it's very important that they knew that. Good. Other questions that are coming? coming up that we need to hit lockers, right now. Lockers, junior high? No lockers at the junior high. No, we won't we, we won't have lockers. Um, are we planning a virtual meet the teacher opportunity? That is, oh, that is. That was it. I just read it. Yeah, that, that, yes. that is one of the, uh, as we talk about, um, the start of school schedule right now, we're scheduled for August 19th start. Uh, and, and I guess I can jump to that at this point in time or, or, or speak just to that a little bit before I get to the end. Uh, that's one of the discussions in the that we'll have on the 27th with the board. We had a discussion during an information item with our board on the 20th in terms of what bringing back uh, uh, students and teachers might look like. Um, given the conditions, given the changes that we just recently got from TEA, um, uh, what's the possibility of, of what that might look like? Um, when social distancing of six feet is not an option, will they have to wear a mask? Yes. Um, It's clear that the nine weeks commitment to virtual is there. What if um, a parent has a child start and isn't able to wear a mask all day long and like to start virtual on week four or five? Can, can they, can, do I need to repeat the question? Oh, or they, yeah, I think that would be good if okay. I repeat the question. Well, let me repeat the okay. question that uh, Stacy just said. So there was a question of a nine weeks commitment. So that's important for us for the virtual learning and the in-person because 
Um, uh, TEA, uh, one of their rules, one of the guidance for them is that August 5th date for us um, to leave open the virtual enrollment. So that gives us a very, very short time frame to be able to uh, prepare for virtual teachers at the elementary, how many we need, uh, and then also uh, enroll those students uh, and figure out where they need to be, how many do we have, how many first graders do we have, uh, across the district and in, in each in each area and so we'll get into this more next Tuesday but you know at the K through 5 we will have a virtual teachers that will be teaching that virtual community together at the secondary level uh, each class will have a um, you know students at the high school will be going every day so they'll they'll be there seven days a week just what you have experienced if you've been in high school or had a student in high school but the virtual the students that are coming in virtually will be coming in synchronous synchronously which will be uh, via zoom uh, into the classroom uh, where they will participate in the classroom every other day um, and we'll talk more about this again on Tuesday but in terms of um, uh, you know the date for securing that it's not as critical for um, the shaping of those class loads at the high school although there's some electives and some other areas that we need to look at that some in-person is going to be you know required for but um, to the question itself if I have a, a student who can't wear tries for four weeks and based on our learning time frame can't wear a mask uh, we're going to do what we do when you want to pull out of a class. Um, we're going to, you know, our guideline is we need you to stay in there for the nine weeks because we shape all of our staffing from that. Uh, but we're going to meet with parents and begin, you know, that discussion uh, with them at that point in time. But we really need those students to be in for, for a nine week period of time. So that's an important decision point for parents deciding right now what, what's, what's best for you. And I, and I guess I just, at this point in time, as, as we talk about what's best for you, I just want to give one encouragement. And first of all, validate our parents and friends with ISD who are key partners with us. You're such a key piece of the puzzle. Um, and to validate your decisions in this tough time. I've been a parent myself. Uh, I have two kids um, and both with very different learning, you know, learning styles and, and gifts and that choice has got to be very very difficult for you and, and I get it but you know I, I, I know there's several of you are considering homeschooling uh, at this time we're, we're um, uh, want to just encourage you to at least watch our video this Thursday um, and weigh that decision based on what you what you see the opportunity to have a friends with teacher go through a structured day uh, just take a just take a look at it um, before you make that decision. But again, to validate the difficulty in being a parent right now, uh, we 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 get it. Um, we we understand. Um, just to go back over, when will more information come out about virtual? So talk about the videos, yes. how they're coming out, and next Tuesday. So I'm going to give a time frame uh, that. Um, Thursday or Friday, you will see a video about the virtual learning components that will come from our teaching and learning team. So that should, if you, if you look at that, that should answer a lot of your questions. Also on the reopening page on our, um, what was approved by the board on, on Monday night, and Dana, help me with the name of that. Uh, Sorry. What's the, the banners on the front of our website? Um, it's, it's a, called a reopening. It just says reopening. 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 So if you yes. kick on, click on that, You'll see that document. There's links to the K-5 and the 612 that have sample schedules in it, have a lot of explanations about uh, the learning pieces in there um, that, that, that would be valuable to you. And, and uh, Lauren Ambo is our Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, and Kim Coles, our Executive Director of Secondary Teaching and Learning. They'll both be speaking uh, directly to those over that, over that time frame. Okay, if a student tests positive and has to go virtual for their quarantine recovery period, can they return to in-person learning once they are cleared or will they have to wait until the end of the nine weeks? No, they're only going to be out the, the amount of time that they're either quarantining or 
Eric, this would be a good time, actually. This question brings that about. Talk about if you're lab tested positive, what allows you to come back to um, in-person instruction? There's there's some conditions. There's three conditions you have to meet. Talk, speak to that. I'm on four from here. So. So one of the, the being if you're lab tested positive the conditions for you know you you have to be one symptom free um, if you if you are taken out of school um, because of symptoms and you don't know that you're lab positive um, first let me let me talk about that first if you're taken out of school for symptoms not knowing that you're lab positive um, you know the question is do I go get tested you know, as the test would take sometimes up to a week now in order to get that test back. Um, what do I do? So you have to be uh, fever free for 72 hours. There is gonna be some guidance changes on this because we're receiving additional guidance right now, but fever free for 72 hours. Um, you have to uh, be free of those symptoms you can have an alternate diagnosis by a doctor. That's one of the options that if it's not COVID symptom and you get an alternate diagnosis that you can return back to school, but uh, uh, symptom free or negative test would get you back into the classroom as well. Being able to prove that you got a negative test back from a, a lab tested COVID site. Some of our key people and Eric meets with them, met with them before we got here, are our nurses. Those are gonna be, they're our, they're our contact people at the back of this document that um, are going to be helping with answering those questions about what do I do we're, we're working on guidance for you for if this happens with me with my student if this happens with me with my student if I have this situation so that we can hand you those things so you get a better idea about probably one of the biggest fears and one of ours is this coming in and out um, of, of school um, bouncing back and forth uh, so we have some good good clear guidance on that but but one of those key things is that lab tested positive is it uh, the ability to move forward until that lab test um, comes back um. One, Sorry, question, one, one question that's, that, that, that I've, I've seen on here that's on my list of questions that's been um, uh, asked is would an in-person pre-K teacher be the one teaching virtual students? And the answer that's no, that virtual students, as I said, are gonna have their, um, their, own, uh, their, their own teacher. Uh, will there be technology available for every student? Uh, because of the, t uh, um, the, the amount of touch for our, right now we have Chromebooks at every level and each class has a set of Chromebooks at the high school, so students you know, use those Chromebooks that are in the world history class and they move to English and do that. So because of that, we're gonna issue, a move to a one-on-one -on -one platform in grades six through 12. We're uh, talking right now about the details of those handouts for those in-person and also those that are virtual that may be in need of a, a Chromebook or, um, or internet access. At the lower levels, the student will have the Chromebook for the day. So my son's name's Reed. If he was in first grade in Miss Owens' class, he would uh, have a Chromebook for the day or an iPad for the day um, uh, that he would be using, and then that would be cleaned at the end of the day before the next student um, uses it the, the following day. We will, you know, we're. One of the things that we're going to ask you to do is send you with your own student supplies. Those things will come out later. I don't want you to worry about worry about that right now. Um, those communications will come out from the campus in terms of what they need uh, uh, for for school supplies, but to just not share pencils and scissors and those things like we've done in the past, which has been in, in you know crates on top of on top of tables. Um, his parents said since kindergarten classrooms use tables and not desks, I know six feet will not be possible, but masks will not be required. 
Can parents send in clear partitions or anything to help establish a separation between students? Give us an opportunity to work through that with our, uh, with our teachers as we get started uh, the school year, started for the school year um, to be able to figure that one piece out. But, but uh, you're right, kindergarten students would have that table and that table would be you know, important for them to, to, to stay with that group as we think about um, close and personal contact as, as Eric described. Mr. Ward, can you talk about um, lunches a little bit more, um, for example, the high school, how there's going to be additional places to sit to spread the kids out, how the junior high is increasing their number of lunches, and what the, the and you may have already spoken about it, but what the elementary lunch situation is going to look like? You know, I'm, I, I, the specifics are hard to shape right now, um, but I'll go back to at the elementary level, the idea would be for um, Mr. Rohr's class to stay together at lunch and be separated from Mrs. Owen's class or Mr. Kreider's class so that they're not mixing. Um, so that's, 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 what's in, that's what we're focusing on and keeping, that, keeping them uh, distant. So that may mean eating in different areas. Um, that may mean lunch schedules spread out further at the elementary levels. Um, at the high school levels, uh, it will be locations for um, uh, my, uh, for students to eat with lower numbers. Right now we just have one lunchroom with, with kids all around the circular tables, but it will be you know, tables in what we call the malls or the big areas that, you, that are in the front and the back. We, we, our terminology is the new mall and the old mall. Um, that there would be tables there that will be taken up and down with, with chairs around them. Uh, where students would sit in smaller groups to be able to eat lunch. And then to serve out of those two snack bar areas as well to be able to distance out between lines um, uh, of students as they're, as they're standing in line. We're going to a no touch uh, swipe card for students as well versus punching in, punching in the keys. There will be partitions, PPE for those who are serving lunch uh, students won't be able to serve themselves, so we'll want to keep those clean and then cleaning between between lunches. Uh, one question is, can you touch on what will happen um, if a teacher becomes ill? What is that going to look like for the class? So uh, let's let's take a specific example. Um, we have a lab tested positive teacher at the uh, elementary level. Mm -hmm. So Eric uh, just spoke to what that teacher will have to do um, to be able to return back. And if they're, if they're ill, um, then they will be out for you know, that amount of time um, and we would find a substitute, we would get a substitute to put in there. One of the things that we're doing, uh, preparing for is hiring uh, substitutes that will be full-time substitutes. So we'll have substitutes assigned to each campus um, to give us a start for if we don't need those that number of subs that day they will be able to help support the protocols and things that are going on uh, on those campuses uh, helping with hallway uh, moving um, to be able to fill that if we were in a um, situation where um, the student or the the teacher had close and personal contact and was with a student and was home for 14 days, which would be what would be required, then what we would want to work out would be for that teacher to teach virtually from home, if at all possible, with the substitute or someone covering that classroom just to have the management of that classroom, move students to place to place, but that the instruction could still come. It would allow that teacher to, uh, to not have to use those days um, and also have direct instruction from, from that teacher. How many students will be allowed to go to the bathroom? And um, what about water fountains? Will water fountains um, be on? You wanna talk about water fountains? So the water fountains, actually we're getting a count right now of how many water fountains we have in a school as compared to bottle, fill, bottle filling stations. Um, the bottle filling stations will be usable. The water fountains will not. The water fountains will be locked off to where they can, uh, students or staff can't use them. So a water bottle for the bottle, bottle filling station would be the, uh, the way to go. And we're gonna make sure that we have that uh, throughout the campuses. So if we have to change out 
from a water fountain to a bottle filling station we'll do that prior to school starting what was the other question that um restrooms how are we going to limit the number of people that come into a restroom teachers are going to be very aware of the need for that distancing and not not mixing and so you know we have different situations in different areas that's one of the things that the campuses will need to work out but it's you know that's what teachers are experts at is being able to know how to how to work that in a in a pod at bales or in a large upper level at the high school for example one, well, I, I just want to give a clarification to one thing too with the uh, um, lab tested positive versus suspected. Um, if you hear of somebody that may have COVID-19 and that information is on social media or something like that, we are not going to send out communications of a lab positive test for that. We are only going to send out confirmed lab uh, tested cases. Um, because if we did it every time there was rumored to be somebody that had a positive case, we just can't get in the business of doing that. So it's going to be a positive test. And I wanted to do some clarification on the confirmed uh, COVID-19, the requirements to return back. Um, so the three conditions that are met, and I want to read these to you so people understand these. It's 72 hours have passed since the recovery uh, without fever or fever reducing medications individual has improvements in symptoms and 10 days have passed since the first symptoms appeared and the other options are the alternate diagnosis or two negative covid tests not within a 24-hour period so you can't go to a rapid test site in texas city and then to a rapid test site in leak city two hours later to get um, two negative tests they have to be 24 hours apart in uh, separation of the test I just wanted to clarify. Thanks, that. Eric. I'm not for sure. It might be a high school student has asked a question. Not for sure. But can high school students leave campus and go to lunch? So to uh, minimize the number of kids on campus. <laughs> That's a. <laughs> I have it, an answer to that question. It may be a. It may be a high school student. You know, yes. it's funny. I graduated from Friendswood High School, and we had open campus. Uh, I did not. Stacy, what year did you graduate? 95. It was 95. closed. We so had I, I graduated in 86, and we had, so somewhere between Stacy and I. It was my class. Your class. We did not get Okay. To um, <laughs> we've talked about it, uh, honestly. We talked about it, but the reason that we canceled uh, off-campus lunch remains a safety issue, and that safety issue is still present. So, um, unfortunately, COVID's changed a lot of things, but it hasn't changed, hasn't changed that. Can you speak to... Um, <laughs> what the district is going to do to ensure that teachers are trained on how to, um, you know, really know all the guidelines and how they're going to implement the guidelines with, with the students. How can we assure? How, how are we going to train our teachers? Um, what is that going to look like? Do you want to speak to that, Eric? Yes, sir. So I, I can tell you that we are working on a, a, a COVID-19 employee handbook, as well as working with the nurses for training um, with the staff so when the staff come back they're going to receive training in both our safety and security side of things because we can't put that on the back burner that is just as important now as ever and also they will receive training in all these protocols so they know and understand what to do and they're going to be held to these guidelines as we move forward so between the nurses and myself that training will be conducted with all staff members across the district so that's our requirement. And I, I want to talk to one part of that is, you know, uh, some of our most recent, recent guidance came out last Thursday, so a week ago. So we're receiving things all the way along that, that change the landscape. And we may, between now and the first day that we have school, have the same thing. And so time is a critical uh, piece for our teachers to be able to do what you just asked. And if, it, if, if the question is, you know, being able to train teachers. So one of the things that we're working on right now is how do we provide more time? Um, you know, the, the, if I'm sitting in your shoes, I might say, well, what have you been doing all summer? Well, teachers don't come on contract, uh, the ones who are in the trenches, until August 12th. So trying right now to figure out how can we give them more time to be able to not only get what we typically jam into five days, but also to do all these safety protocols and all the pieces that go along with it as well. So it's a good question.
Um, one thing that we've heard, and, and we haven't changed in here, but I think it's come up in every town hall that I've been at. We've done two employee town halls, uh, we presented to the board, and uh, is this idea of, um, there's some specific guidance in here about uh, what we do with students who show up with, with symptoms at the, at the school. And, uh, you know, they have, a, you know, teacher sees, teachers can see, especially the little guys, they're hot, they're, you know, likely have a fever, and that we get the nurse involved right away. Um, we use the term in here, isolation room. Uh, and that has a bad connotation to it. And we've heard that over and over again. So we're, we're talking about what that might change because we, we know we're gonna have cases. We know we're gonna have students that are gonna have to go and be in that area apart from other students or distance from other, other, other students uh, because of that. We have, you know, we're gonna still have the flu, we're gonna still have strep throat, we're gonna still have earaches, those things that may happen. It, we really are depending on you to keep students home that aren't feeling well and you know your kids better than anybody else uh, when you look at that symptom list. But um, we're, I, that's been a comment in, in every place we've gone. So we're looking at that name right now. That may change in that document before we, we, we get you know, started. What it is is we're simply just separating the students that has possible COVID symptoms from a student that may have bumped their knee on the playground that the nurse is handling. Um, you know, I, I like to use the term, you know, overflow area or whatnot, but uh, yeah, I know that isolation may not have been the best term, but that's all it is, is really of a separation of students because we don't want to put a healthy student in harm's way if somebody has symptoms of possible COVID-19. And all of that is part of, and that's, you know, we're just asking for your help in that. Where I started out with was just the distancing and separation that this causes, COVID causes, you know, and we're, again, we're going to have symptoms, we're going to have cases, and just just respect each other. No, I, I might get it. Um, that, that very well might happen. Um, and so just being able to honor those families, those students who are in those situations and, and be, you know, grace, space, and understanding of what, what we ask for. Um, so one question, will students going from in-class instruction to virtual due to a positive COVID test Will they be doing the exact same curriculum? Well, the question is, will students who go from in-class instruction to virtual... Because of COVID. Because of COVID, uh, be doing the exact same instruction. At the grades 6 through 12, it, it will be, they'll be following that same. They'll just be with their peers who are virtual. So if I'm in a biology class uh, and I'm doing face-to-face -face instruction, there may be three or four virtual students who are on uh, uh, synchronously listening to that lesson every uh, every other day, um, and and again, listen to those that presentation. You'll get more on that at the K through five level. If they're going to be quarantining for that fourteen uh, day period, um, then they will move into a virtual teacher's uh, classroom. So if we have if, if I'm the first grade virtual teacher and Eric's teaching first grade and we have a student that's going to have to quarantine for 14 days, they'll be moved into my first grade virtual piece. And one of the things that we've worked on all summer long is the importance of the scope and, of scope and sequencing in all these areas, knowing that this was coming. And so uh, may we be, uh, the, the activities may be a little bit different. But where we are to be able to move back and forth to, there's a pivot protocol that's been established uh, by our assistant superintendent. But again, those are things we, we still need to yet to share with, with our, our teaching staff um, and get their input on that, be, be part of that. But being able to make communication from Eric to me that this student is moving into my class, here's where we are, here's what's going on. And then as, as we move back into, they get well or they've met their 14 days as they move back so where our grade books are seamless moving back and forth across um, and in the instructions the same way. What about fire drills and large assemblies, pep rallies, those kind of things we've traditionally done? I'll, I'll hit the last two. Large assemblies and pep rallies won't happen indoors until we get different guidance and that could be one of the pieces of guidance that could change. Right now there's some outdoor uh, pep rally protocols that would be social distancing with masks on 
we still need to look closely at that, but you can expect for the fall that we won't have indoor large gatherings or pep rallies. Now, I know Eric's working specifically on the fire drill safety piece, so let him speak to that. So on the school safety side of it, you know, of course we uh, deal directly with the Texas School Safety Center out of uh, San Marcos, and that's where we get our guidance from. And also with the fire marshal, we're basically getting our guidance from the state or local fire marshal's office. Um, we will have drill requirements. Um, how those drills will look and how many of those drills we'll have to do, um, we're still waiting on additional guidance. Right now, the Texas School Safety Center says that you only are required to do one fire drill per year, but it's up to your local fire marshal in order to allow you that. And they're waiting on uh, information to get back, guidance back from the state. So those drills will probably look a little different. Um, and how they're conducted and how they're done and how many is out there, but we are still waiting additional guidance, but we will get that out there as soon as we can. Um, can you talk, um, can you speak to a start date? Um, so what are you anticipating? Still August 19th or considering starting along the same lines as CCISD? Uh, since we're coming towards the end, we'll still, we'll still you know, take questions till 4.15, but let, let me jump to that. So, you know, we've talked about the need for, for time uh, for teachers. Uh, the board at, on the 27th will be considering, um, you know, one, do we have enough time with the five days that we have uh, for teacher in-service? So would a move, uh, would a pushing back of that of that start date uh, allow for more time on the training for protocols virtual learning to have a successful start uh, with with our with our students which we'd want to be prepared for uh, the other consideration would be for some uh, some time in virtual uh, some time in virtual learning possibly uh, for uh, you know preparing everyone that that could be a part of it what that might look like and then lastly the idea of some transitioning time so being able to transition uh, uh, smaller groups in over a, a period of, of a couple days to be able to um, allow our teachers, our staff to work with a smaller group arriving, smaller group at lunch, a smaller group at dismissal, implementing those protocols. So those three things will be really what they, what they consider. Um, uh, coming up on the 27th, uh, that, that, that evening, um, uh, in terms of, of what would be next. There have been a lot of questions specifically about 504 and special ed and special services, and I'm just replying online, but just to reiterate that those will be addressed and talked about at the next town right, hall meeting. Right, so we'll capture, we'll, we'll capture mm -hmm. those. Uh, the question was about 504 special services um, uh, to be able to speak to those spe specific pieces. Um, I know one thing that's, that's important to us is our, 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 our um, our students who might need that with those pre-k ppcd quest classes um we know we need to get them in person as as soon as possible uh and, and know that that's important for um for what's happened over this spring and in, into this time frame so but we will we'll, we'll we'll capture those questions and be ready to answer those as we as we keep uh, on tuesday sir could you touch on uh, tennis policies real quick i mean as far as exemptions and things yeah. like that how that will work um uh we will once we get our our uh our teams back um together we'll talk through two things really and, and, and i mean you can you can mark it in your book right now that perfect attendance won't be a part of of this next school year what that'll look like and then the exemption policy, that's one of the things that encourages students who might not be feeling well to come to school. The high school is looking at that right now. And right now, if you looked at our student code of conduct or our student handbook online, it would still have the same exemption policy. You can expect that to change between now and when we bring kids back into school. If you could just, um, in the last couple of minutes that we have, just um, talk about um, again, what they can expect to hear from us um, with the videos. Um, next week, we're going to do another uh, Facebook Live and, um, and the reopening on our website, all the information. 
So what you can expect to hear next week from the teaching and learning, which is what we hope uh, you'll watch. Um, we'll, we'll send that out to everybody. That if you'll watch that closely, can, I think we'll be able to answer a lot of your questions about the, um, the virtual piece. Uh, and also the pivoting piece from going from in-person to virtual, what that might look like. Um, you can expect to hear, you know, who will be, uh, you know, who will be teaching what, what you'll, you'll see sample schedules and those schedules are actually up right now. You'll be able to hear about that. You'll hear about what the expectation of a term that we're calling the learning coach, which would be somebody or, gr or, or number of people at home that are helping to facilitate the learning. Uh, um, for our students that are in uh, grades K through five, um, what the expectations for that person would be. Um, the, the 504, the special ed, the GT piece, um, uh, SRPs, supplemental uh, reading instruction, dyslexia. You could expect to hear about those things in uh, the video and or when we hit back the Facebook Live next Tuesday. Um, you, uh, you know, as we shape um, more of the specifics, then you'll start to see from campuses specifics about um, those individual campus guidelines for arrivals, uh, specifically dismissals, um, uh, those specific pieces. I hope that answered that question, Ms. Owen. It did. Um, any Closing words. I think we're done with the questions. Okay. No. No. No more questions. Mm -mm. And, and if there are questions, of course, give us time to read back through them, and we'll get those right, answered. Right. Right. We'll look at those, and maybe even, maybe even on Tuesday, we can start out with something, some things that we might have, we have might have missed here. Uh, again, just uh, want to reiterate, um, you know, how important this time, this time is for us uh, to sit together and be able to share questions and ideas. Um, please uh, continue to um, keep up with our website, with our communications that, that come out uh, from the district. We'll, we'll keep pushing those out. Um, this is, uh, this is the, be the, the end of the beginning uh, phase. We still have a long way to go together. Um, and again, I just would reiterate my gratitude to our parents, really to our teachers and to our staff, our administrators. Our administrators have worked uh, all summer long working on basically the procedures in the campuses that then drove the protocols. Um, so grateful for them. Our board who spent a lot of time uh, meeting over the summer uh, um, during that time and, and to our staff here that, that continues to, to work. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing your kids whether it's going to be on a screen or in person. We can't wait for school to start. That's what we we're in this for not for a job. We're in this for a mission, and now we have a, a, a bigger mission ahead of us, and we're going to step up to the challenge and do the best we can, and we'd ask you to do the same.